Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, and I believe probably finish up this wisdom book today. I believe that it was written by King Hezekiah as a response to his life crisis, where he found that he was going to die, begged God for more time, was given 15 more years, which no doubt he celebrated over but then recognize that after the 15 years, he was still going to die. Uh, When you are faced with your own mortality, uh, that causes you to ponder on life itself. And so this book is all about that pondering um, and the fact that you've got to make the most of it, uh, that it is full of turmoil and even randomness that is very frustrating. And you can't let that get you down. You've still got to follow God's wisdom and trust him that it'll all work out in the end. So Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1, says this, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Now, this is not talking about taking a loaf of bread and going out to the river and just tossing it on there and then going back later to see if it comes back because more than likely it's going to be gobbled up by the ducks and the geese. Uh, This is talking about planting procedures. Uh, It's very prominent for the planting in Nile uh, uh, in Egypt, but it happened in other places as well that when you have kind of a a flood time, that this would bring new rich sediment into a field and you would immediately plant into that sludge, that, that, uh, that sediment, and then your crop would grow up and it would produce fruit and you'd go back and get it uh, at harvest time. And so it's basically the idea of Plant at the best possible time so that you can get a return on it. So it's thinking about the future and doing some reasonable planning. That's appropriate. Uh, Verse 2, give a portion to seven, even eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. So divide your stuff up over, you know, different areas. Uh, They use this term diversify when they're talking about your stock portfolio because you don't know what might happen to one sector of the stock market. And if you're diversified, you'll be okay because the risk has been spread out. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, More than likely, he's talking about You don't keep all your animals in the exact same field, and you don't plant only one field. You plant plenty of fields because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. A little bit of a duh, isn't it? Uh, It's going to rain when it rains, right? Right? If a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. That's a reality. Trees that have fallen don't just get up on their own and move around. Things happen, and that's just the way they are. Verse 4, he says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Now, what does he mean by this? When they sowed their seed, uh, they did it by hand. And if it happened on a really, really super windy day, it scattered the seed in a weird pattern. And so sometimes you would kind of pay attention to whether or not the day was windy. But if you always went, well, there's a wind blowing it today, I don't want to go out there and take a chance that it's going to scatter my seed wrong. If every single day you got up and said, no, it's, it's windy today. No, it's windy today. 
Well, it might be windy for all the different days. If you only do that over and over and over again, you'll never get the seed into the ground and you'll never be able to harvest. Uh, the Regarding the clouds here is the idea that if you're saying, ah, oh, it's a cloudy day, it looks like it's going to rain, it's going to be bad weather, I can't go out there and reap my harvest. Well, if you keep doing that repeatedly over and over and over and over again, you're never going to get the harvest in. There are some risks that you have to take. You have to pull the trigger, as we say, at some point and get the job done and take the chance that maybe some random thing is going to... Uh, uh, take away from your efforts. You can't control it. Verse 5, As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones of the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. We know that the first man came into existence in this fashion. God formed his body out of the dust of the earth, the material of him, out of the, the elements of earth. And then he blew into him, into his nostrils, the breath of life, and he became a living soul. We know that's how the first human being came into existence. Second human being came into existence by God taking some of the physical matter of that first human being and then making another body and presumably breathing into her nostrils the breath of life and she became a living soul. But God put into them the ability to reproduce. And he actually told them that they needed to do that. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. This scripture is basically saying we don't understand how that next process happens that somehow a physical baby comes into existence in the womb of the woman and the breath of God, the life force of God, comes into that baby. I believe it all happens at conception. But we don't see that happen. Even if you were to be able to time it in such a way that you could... Uh, watch the moment inside the woman's womb that the egg became fertilized. You wouldn't, through that observance, be able to see God's power of life come into the child. It's just one of those things we have to take for granted. Uh, it's beyond our physical senses. Verse number six, if in the morning, sow your seed, and then at evening, withhold not your hand, for you don't know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike may be good. Uh, so, it's, again, the idea of diversification, spreading things out. Uh, you don't know if planting the seed first thing in the morning is going to have the best produce, or planting the seed at the end of the day, or planting the seed in the middle of the day. You don't know. So it doesn't hurt to just do it at all those different times and uh, let them grow up. Verse 7, light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Think about that. Uh, again, I believe that this is Hezekiah writing this and uh, the sun for him is symbolic of life because it's, you know, another day. Well, it's great to be able to get up in the morning, open your eyes, and see another day. It's a sweet thing to have another day given to you by God. And every last one of us need to acknowledge that. Verse 8. So, if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. So be happy with the life you get. But let him remember the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. So even though we're advised to make the most of life, enjoy the good days as they come, be aware there's going to be bad ones as well. It's a mixed bag, life is. 
and everything is vanity. It's not that it's worthless. I think I've repeated that enough now. It's that it's out of our control. We cannot take it and shape it and jam it in a box and save it for later. It's to be lived in the moment. Verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the, and the sight of your eyes, but know for all these things God will bring you into judgment. So here he's writing to younger people, people that are just getting started on probably their adult life. He says, guys, enjoy your lives. Enjoy your young life. Um, Again, I I remind you that I'm recording this uh, many weeks before you actually hear it. Uh, It's still before Christmas for me, and and we watched uh, It's a Wonderful Life not too long ago. And we've watched it many, many times. And there's one scene in which uh, the older gentleman on the porch is frustrated that there's uh, not any action on the part of uh, the male character to kiss the female character. And he says, oh, youth is wasted on the wrong people. That's what is being written here, is you young people, You need to make the most of your life because you've got the strength. You've got everything in front of you to enjoy it. So don't waste it, but understand as you live it, this reality, you will have to answer to God for how you lived it. So you remember how the conclusion is coming up soon. Fear God keep his commandments because all of us are going to answer to him for what we did with this life. So, young people, have a good time with your life. Enjoy it. But remember, God is watching and you will answer to him. Verse 10, remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Again, still talking, I think, to the younger person. Uh, get, get all that bad stuff out of your life. And yes, you have some pain in there. Push past that. But remember that you are getting older. And you can't control life. So enjoy it now while you can. And that introduces chapter number 12, the final chapter. And it is targeted to the younger people who may not understand how precious life is when they're in the middle of it. And so here are the older people talking back to them. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. Now evil here is not intended as a moral comment. It's the idea of the rough days, the nasty days those horrid later days when you're older. So remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you say, I have no pleasure in them. Meaning when life is not as happily lived, when your body doesn't want to cooperate as much and there's aches and pains aplenty. Now I used to think uh, like a young person. And I didn't worry about what the future held. But here I am at the beginning of my 60s, and I'm realizing there's a lot of aches and pains that come with being older. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't have aches and pains. And so I would join in with the writer of Ecclesiastes to tell you younger people, hey, Enjoy life before the aches and pains come. Verse 2, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. Now he's engaging in some metaphors here, some similes, some symbolic language. More than likely, verse 2 is a description 
of the onset of cataracts, which in years previous were just part of life. There wasn't much you could do about it. And so the light of the sun, the light of the moon, and the stars uh, all got clouded over by the coming of the cataracts on the eyes in older age. Verse 3, in the days, uh, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble, that's a reference to the hands, and some people develop these tremors as they get older, not always related to Parkinson's or something like that, it, it, it's related to other less threatening and debilitating diseases, but it's still just as irritating. And the strong men are bent. Osteoporosis, uh, the slumping over of the backbone uh, that can sometimes come in older people, particularly among ladies, and I'm sorry about that, ladies. Uh, Make sure you take all your vitamins and uh, get plenty of good calcium, okay? But Here, we're speaking to the younger people. You better enjoy life before old age starts bending you over. And the grinders cease because they are few. That's talking about the teeth. Uh, These people ate uh, years and years of stone ground wheat and barley. And those bits and pieces would get in and grind their teeth down. And so a lot of them would lose their teeth as they became older. That was just part of getting older. And those who look through the windows are dimmed. Eyesight uh, is not only affected by cataracts. It can be affected uh, by changes in, in the shape of your eye. This is one of the reasons why uh, when you hit your 40s, Uh, many of us suddenly need different types of eyewear. Uh, And we need bifocals and trifocals and reading glasses. Hey, young people, enjoy your eyesight while you're young because it's going to change when you get older. Verse 4, And the the doors on the street are shut Uh, When the sound of the grinding is low and one rises at the sound of the bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. Uh, Again, kind of playing on some things here. It sounds like he's talking about life in the city and things happening, but he's actually also talking about the fact that the hearing starts to go. And uh, I've, I've noticed this. I sometimes have to ask people to speak a little bit louder or repeat themselves. Uh, and one of these days, I'll probably have to break down and get myself some type of hearing aid. That's just par for the course. Uh, but that's what he's talking about. It's part of getting old. Uh, rising up at the sound of the bird. Hey, how many of us, when we're older, start getting up way too early in the morning? Uh, I am constantly waking up earlier than I intend to and then can't get back to sleep. It's it's something that older people talk about with one another. It's just the way it works, folks. So younger people, enjoy a good sound sleep while you're young because it won't always be there. Verse 5, they are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. As people age, they start to also lose body mass and uh, physical capabilities. And even some of the people that was that were the most courageous and strong suddenly realized that they could not defend themselves like they used to. And so you will see people, let's use the example of Marines that used to be really peak physical capability. And yet, When they get old, they sometimes hide behind multiple locks. They don't like to go to certain places at certain times because they're afraid they might get waylaid because their life has changed as they got older. Let's continue. The almond tree blossoms. (laughs) That's the old hair at the top of the head turning white. The grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails. Uh, A lot of the commentators 
ponder, wonder aloud whether or not this line is a reference to what's referred to today as ED, erectile dysfunction. And that uh, this also is something that kind of goes along with being old. And uh, that you younger people better enjoy your vitality while you have it. And then he starts wrapping it down. Because man is going to his eternal home and mourners go about in the streets. Because this is where it's all heading. You're born, you grow up, you live your life, you get old, and head downhill, and then you die. All of us are on that path somewhere. And then people, hopefully, will be mourning our passing. And here he's saying, make the most of it before any of that happens. Verse 6, before the silver cord is snapped. I find that intriguing because some people have reported in what's referred to as near-death experiences that they feel like they're tethered uh, by this silver cord. And maybe that was reported back in ancient times as well, and so it made its way into this. And so when the cord is snapped, you're dead. Or the golden bowl is broken. So life is something precious. It's held in a golden bowl until you're dead and the bowl is broken. Or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain. Again, a container that has a purpose, has a use. But then when it's broken, it's done. Or the wheel broken at the cistern. Again, something that has a purpose, something that has a use. But then it gets old and worn out and it's broken and it's done. And now, the famous phrase, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So death of the body puts it into decomposition, where it breaks down into the elements that it came from. And the spirit, our soul, the life force that's been written in, written on by our personality, that then has to answer to God. Vanity of vanity, says the collector, all is vanity. I repeat one last time. We're not talking about worthlessness here. We're talking about something that is out of our control. Life cannot be grabbed hold of, shaped, stuffed in a box, and saved for later. It has to be lived in the here and now. We must make the most of it now. Verse 9. Besides being wise, the collector also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. And we know for a fact that King Hezekiah uh, added even more of Solomon's Proverbs to the original Proverbs, and uh, apparently also some other Proverbs from other people. So he was in the habit of collecting and arranging many Proverbs to try to help people understand the need for God's wisdom. The collector sought to find words of delight and upright Uh, And uprightly, he wrote words of truth. So his goal was to help people out, to help people live life to the fullest as God intended. Verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads. You know what a goad is? It's, It's what's used to make animals do what you want them to do. So that's what words are for, is to help others do what they need to do. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm goading you to make the most of life by using God's words. Like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings that are given by one shepherd. All of us try to make sure we're careful how we affix things to the walls in our house. We want them to bear the weight. We look for the stud. If we can't find the stud, we put the little special... um, filler in uh, that we can that will bear the weight of whatever it is that we're going to be putting up on the wall that's what he's saying is 
the wise sayings that we've been looking at in the Proverbs and the Ecclesiastes, they are given by God, one shepherd, to help us hang our life securely on those wise sayings. My son, beware of anything beyond these, of making of many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. And boy, that is true. There are tons of things out there. Books published all the time. More books than any of us could ever read in a lifetime are being published every single day. Forget that stuff. You can enjoy some of it. That's true. But I'm saying for the purposes of being a believer, this is where you need to focus your attention. Verse 13, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God, that is, respect him, and keep his commandments, that is, do what he tells you and me to do. For this is the whole duty of man. We were created in the image and likeness of God to spend an eternity with him. To be like him. So we need to respect him and we need to listen to what he has to say and do it. That's why we exist and why we will exist for eternity. And this is the final warning, verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Everything will be accounted for to God. Now, thankfully, we have had our sins forgiven. And all of that bad choice stuff has been blotted out. It's been moved as far as the east is from the west. But we need all of us to understand the choices we make here will be accounted for in the hereafter. So choose carefully. Fear God. Do things his way. That brings Ecclesiastes to the end. Tomorrow, we'll get back together and talk about Hezekiah coming to an end.